Good morning. Is the mic on? I really appreciate everybody being here this morning. Uh, I am State Senator Vanita Becker from Evansville, and I also want to introduce two other state senators that are here today. Senator Erling Rogers is here today, and also Senator Karen Talion of Portage. Senator Rogers is from Geary. There were a few other folks uh, that were supposed to be here. I know uh, Senator Alton was supposed to be here, but he's not feeling well this morning, so he was unable to make it. We're here today to share some information, the results of a study by the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability in Chicago. And copies of the study will be given to you in just a moment. And the presenter will take questions at the end of the presentation. First of all, let me clarify, the state of Indiana did not commission this study. Indiana taxpayers did not pay for this study. The study originated because Illinois has one school choice option, which is an individual tax credit. As in other states, Illinois legislators receive requests to consider expanding the use of school vouchers. People there quite wisely decided it would be a good idea first to study what has occurred in other states to understand if vouchers are a good use of taxpayer resources in Illinois. Because Indiana is an adjacent and Midwest state and a state that has a very large voucher program, Indiana is among several state voucher programs studied by an independent research firm. Today, that research firm is sharing its conclusions. The Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, or CTBA, is a bipartisan nonprofit research and advocacy think tank. CTBA works as a technical advisor to legislators on both sides of the political aisle to provide policy briefings, technical assistance, and key testimony at the request of legislators. A topic they frequently examine is the intersection between education policy and racial and economic justice. And I do would I would like to, for <coughs> Senator Karen Talion and Senator Erling Rogers just to stand up so that everybody can see them. We thank you. We're we're fortunate today that CTBA is represented by its executive director, Ralph Martiri. Mr. Martiri was appointed to serve on the U.S. Department of Education, Equity, and Excellence Commission in 2011. He also teaches a master's class on education finance and fiscal policy for the University of Illinois and Roosevelt University, where he is a distinguished lecturer on public policy. Additionally, he has taught fiscal policy seminars for various universities and the International Fulbright Scholar Program. Mr. Martiri has received numerous awards for his work on education policy reform. He is also a regular newspaper columnist on education, fiscal, and economic policy issues, and he serves as a school board member for River Forest District 90 in Illinois. So he knows school management from both the theoretical as well as the practical side. He earned a law degree from the University of Michigan, but what I think Hoosiers will like most about him is he is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of IU of Indiana University. Please welcome Ralph Martiri. Good morning. So I am Ralph Martiri, and I am executive director of the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. And to be very clear, we are bipartisan, which means my board of directors neither likes nor trusts each other very much. And, and that's a fantastic thing for the organization because it allows us to focus on best practices and data, evidence-based approach to policy. And frankly, we don't care if a particular initiative happens to be on the conservative side of the ledger, the liberal side of the ledger, or somewhere in the middle, if it comports with best practices, if it's evidence-based, if it meets demographically driven needs, that's something we could support. And if it doesn't, well, we back away. 
And I'm really glad that you mentioned my time on the commission at the federal level, where we had an opportunity, where we were charged by the President of the United States and the U.S. Congress with looking at systems of finance and how they interplayed with public education in America as compared to other nations, and in particular, whether or not our systems of finance were designed in a way that actually promoted student achievement, promoted a sound, rigorous, capable education system, or actually contributed to achievement gaps. We looked very much at those issues. Now, the Indiana legislation became exciting for us to review because it is so comprehensive and it incorporates the two major approaches to school choice that have become sort of a national trend over the last few years. Number one, it has a significant voucher component where parents are given vouchers to cover a portion of the cost of their children's education at private institutions and it's it's means tested up to 200 percent of free and reduced lunch so up to eighty five thousand dollars a year or less in income is the cap and then there's the tax expenditure component of the bill so literally you take tax revenue and spend it through the tax code you allow individuals to keep taxes they otherwise would have to pay to subsidize some private choice decisions. There's an individual deduction where individual taxpayers, and this one's not means tested, can take up to a thousand dollars deduction for each child that they send to a private school or that they homeschool, and they, they can use this deduction to cover the cost of educating those child either in the private school or homeschool. And there's a, there's a very interesting tax credit against the Indiana income tax where individuals and businesses alike can make contributions to something called scholarship granting organizations and these scholarship granting organizations then take the contributions they receive and create scholarships for Indiana students to attend private schools again with that income limit of 200 percent of free or reduced lunch which is which is roughly eighty five thousand dollars a year any individual or corporation that makes a contribution to one of these scholarship granting organizations gets to retain 50% of that contribution as a tax credit against their income tax liability. So you can see over here in the first graphic that there's been a significant growth in Indiana in the utilization of vouchers. And in fact, the most recent fiscal year for, the, for which there's complete data the total cost was $115.9 million expended on vouchers. It's a pretty significant cost. The big question that's raised by this approach to education policy is will it generate enhanced student achievement? In fact, can it be expected to do that at all? And second, is the tax expenditure one that will generate enhanced student achievement or collectively will this approach to public education finance help Indiana create a, a more capable education system, one that has the capacity to provide all its children with a meaningful opportunity to learn. First let's dig down into the voucher experience and I think um, that might be on this slide, the next one over, is that is that the voucher experience slide? That one. Yeah, no, that's not it. There, there are three major and long-standing voucher programs in the U.S. There's the Milwaukee program, the Cleveland program, and the Washington, D.C. program. Each of these programs were subjected to independent study in two cases by universities. The Milwaukee program was studied by the University of Arkansas. The Cleveland program was studied by that halcyon of all universities, Indiana University. And the D DC program was actually studied by the Department of Education. And I think what's compelling about the Department of Education study, frankly, is that both under the presidencies of George W. Bush and Barack Obama, choice, school choice, and school competition are models that have been promoted and vouchers have been promoted. So both of these two presidents in succeeding terms have really supported the voucher movement. Interestingly enough, though, the results of these studies were that there's absolutely no statistical correlation between 
participation in a voucher study and higher student achievement on math or the language arts. In fact, there's no statistical difference in the pools. And that's, in, that's really compelling because these studies were done over a long period of time. They, they were random samples of kids. And they really showed, in fact, that vouchers don't promote student achievement. And interestingly enough, a couple of individuals who've had very strong support of the voucher system at the American Enterprise Inter Institute have now recognized the fact that vouchers, in fact, do not drive enhanced student achievement. We have a couple of quotes from them over here that we'd like to predate. I mean, if you look over here, quote number one basically says, well, after the Milwaukee experience, we could finally say that, yeah, it doesn't drive student achievement, and that's okay. That's okay because we as supporters of the voucher system are moving our rationale for support from one that insists vouchers can actually drive enhanced student achievement to a position where it's no parental choice in and of itself is a good. It's the kind of thing that needs to be supported at the public sector level. Now that's a very interesting argument when you're taking public dollars and using them to subsidize decision making processes you want those public dollars to be generating in some way or some capacity a public good. And here, there is no tangible public good being generated by the expenditure of the resources, which is acknowledged by champions of the, char of, of the movement to vouchers. If you, I think you flip that over, you have the other quote. And, um, you know, the bottom line is even staunch supporters of the voucher system have come to the realization vouchers in and of themselves clearly do not help students achieve to higher levels academically. Then there's the second component. A lot of the theory underlying both the voucher approach in the Indiana legislation and the tax expenditure approach is that if you enhance competition among schools, you'll end up with a better educational system. It's a rational theory. It's predicated very much on a private sector model. And the question is whether or not that theory works. Well, interestingly enough, there's been a lot of nations around the world, including the US, that have gone to this competitive model in public education to see if it can enhance their educational systems. If, in fact, this competition among schools results in the overall system improving itself, in adopting better educational practices, in providing a more rigorous and complete education to children across the board. Here you see the primary OECD countries the US, the UK, et cetera, that have adopted this competitive model. They adopted it in the early 2000s. Next to that, you see their test scores on math. Now, why did we isolate math? Math is the most clear indicator, math success by students, of the actual performance of the schools because parents aren't quite as good as helping their children with math as they are helping their children with language arts. And for truth of that, I don't have to look any further than my own house. I mean, I run a math-based think tank, and I cannot help my high school student with his math. He is completely on his own when he comes home. Interestingly enough, every single nation, every single industrialized OECD nation that adopted this competitive model saw their math scores decline over the decade on the international PISA exams. Every single one of them. So the competitive model didn't work. And there's a reason for that. The competitive model assumes that you will have winners and losers in the system. If you have losers in a public education system, you have schools that aren't performing up to snuff. On its face, that model, which requires schools to be losers, is not one that is likely to enhance an educational system's capacity overall. And in fact, that's what the data very much show us. And if, I'm going to flip this. To go to Finland. Finland is one of the five OECD 
nations, you have Finland, Singapore, Korea, Hong Kong, and Canada, that consistently perform at the very top on math on the PISA exam. All of these countries have rejected this competitive model and have instead focused their education efforts on capacity building. And if you review the research of Michael Fullen here, it's just compelling. So capacity building means the government, the public sector invests in building the capacity of its educational system to meet the needs of all the children who walk through the doors of a school in any neighborhood school. They build up the teaching skills of the extant staff. They build up the pedagogical skills. They, they tie in wraparound services. And crucially, they build in more collaboration between teachers, not just within a school, but within a system so that you have master teachers mentoring other teachers, master teachers sharing with other teachers those skills, those pedagogical practices, which actually reach students. What this has done is it's built the capacity of the entire educational system so that no child is attending a school that isn't up to snuff. Every school has the capacity to meet the needs of the children at the door. We had. Pazi Salberg, the former director of education for Finland, in for a major conference that we held in Chicago, but it was a national conference. It was based on the work I had done in D.C. And, and one of the questions Pazi got asked was, well, what do you do to, about getting rid of bad teachers? And he thought about that for a second. He said, well, you know, in Finland, we don't have bad teachers. We, 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 don't, we, we really don't have a coherent policy on getting rid of them because we build their skills to such a high level and it is so difficult to become a teacher in Finland that all our teachers are good. That's not the problem. In fact, he went a little further and I thought this was compelling. He said, you know what we did in Finland? I mean, it, it, he, he found it very funny that the U.S. was so jealous of how successful Finland has become on building its educational system. He said, all we did was adopt the evidence-based best practices developed in the U.S. and applied them. We did what your science and your evidence suggest works. He says, so I guess if you really want to realize the American dream, you need to move to Finland and go to one of our schools because we are basically putting into practice your best practices and your evidence-based approach to public education. So now let's talk about whether or not Indiana ought to continue its current program. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that not only is the current program one that won't build a better Indiana system, it actually may be detrimental over the long term. Now I'm going to bring up the research of two university professors at the University of Illinois, but their job, which was to look at performance academically on tests and graduation rates, et cetera, of U.S. students for the nation, and they were tasked with this by George W. Bush. They were retained by the Bush administration to review educational practices in the U.S. They were given the deepest data sets to compare literally hundreds of thousands of students and their performance, they were able to control for the first time ever in, in U.S. research for demographics, for geography, for income levels, and for type of school, public, private, charter, Christian, private, non-Christian, whatever. And what they found was interesting. The second you control for all these factors, the premium associated with attending a private school in performance completely disappears. And in fact, public K through 12 schools do a better job of educating children to succeed, particularly at-risk children. And at-risk simply means a child who comes from a low-income background, a child who's an English language learner, or a child who has special needs. The public education system does a much better job of reaching, educating children to succeed who are at risk than does private schools or do, than do charter schools. That's what the data say based on research study commissioned by the administration of George W. Bush. 
And to sort of kick it in a little bit more that there was no ideological bias here, the, the main mathematician of these two professors, Sarah Lubienski, she actually attended private Christian schools her whole life through high school. So she really had an affinity for private Christian schools. And what they found was these were some of the lowest performers. And, and, and why they were low performers, particularly when you looked at meeting the needs of at-risk children, is they didn't have the resources to put into place those additional supports that the evidence indicates actually helps at-risk children succeed on a par with children who are not at risk. Now why that should be troubling for Indiana and Indiana residents is 90 percent of the 314 schools who are part of the Indiana Choice program have some sort of religious affiliation associated with them. So it's highly likely that what Indiana is doing is encouraging and subsidizing with public taxpayer money the movement of students out of the higher performing public education system into a lower performing private system. That's hardly a best use of taxpayer dollars and especially at a time when revenues are a little tight. I, I do know that al although your revenue has been increasing the last year, right, it's underperformed targets. And that creates real challenges for legislators who have built a budget predicated on certain levels of revenue being generated and suddenly you don't have those levels of revenue. So it can't be assumed, and in fact it can probably be assumed, that continuation of this program is not a best use of taxpayer dollars. It actually frustrates the, the compelling purposes of number one, helping enhance student achievement, which is the number one goal of all policymakers and frankly that all taxpayers share when it comes to a public education system. You want to enhance student achievement, these programs cannot be expected to do that. In fact, they may actually diminish student achievement over time. Number two, you want your investments of taxpayer money, whether they are tax expenditures through your code or expenditures for vouchers, to build an education system that has the capacity to really provide a meaningful, rigorous education to all your kids. Unfortunately, the, the adoption of this competitive model runs contrary to both international best practices and what we've learned from the U.S. And, and it even creates a disincentive for the core part of capacity building, that collaborative piece. Because really, if you're comp competing this school against that school, this school's got no skin in helping the, the teaching staff in that school improve their practice. In fact, they do better if these guys fail. Th that is completely contrary to what has worked in those industrialized OECD nations that have, in fact, seen a better return on their taxpayer investment for education policy. So there are a number of really big concerns about this Indiana legislation. And I think given, and there is that last slide there, the fact that overall K-12 funding after you adjust for inflation in Indiana is down, uh, and down by you know, $300 million, that it would be unwise to continue diverting revenue from a system that's being under-resourced to begin with and diverting that revenue to practices that have been proven not to be effective. So I, I'm going to stop there because I, you know, if you gave, left it up to me, I would talk for the next hour and a half and throw a bunch of data points at you, but I think it'd be better if I answered questions. Any questions? Pardon? Well, well y you know, it seems as if if you follow international best practices, what you ought to do is probably get these programs off the books, stop subsidizing things like parental choice. And, and I want to be very clear. Parental choice is a right parents have. Parents can decide they want to send their kid to a private school or a religious-based school, whatever. They have every right to do that. It's just that the public sector ought not subsidize that decision, right? So I think that that's really the quim. You ought to get these programs off the book and you ought to invest more in building the capacity of your system. I think one area that Indiana needs to seriously look at 
based on our review, and once again, the senators could tell me if I'm wrong on this review, but I, but I think Indiana has scaled back significantly its financial support for teacher induction and mentoring and for professional development. Well, these are some of the best practices that have been shown to really enhance student achievement over time. So if you took this money that is being spent on something that generates no public benefit and instead invested it on something that the evidence suggests actually enhances student achievement over time, you get far bigger bang for your taxpayer dollar, which is really what we're all about when you have tight resources in a state government setting. Oh, no. I, uh, <laughs> I hear myself speak it more than enough. I'm more than happy to have Senator Rogers come up here. I had not planned to speak. I was just here to listen. Uh, but uh, as we moved along, I didn't know whether to say hallelujah or amen. Uh, because some of the data that has been brought to us this morning is data that many of us have espoused as we've moved through the legislative process. You know, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that, that we've got the evidence here to support some of the things that we have been saying as legislators. You know, number one, you know, that uh, we started out with vouchers saying that it was going to enhance student achievement. So if it's not enhancing student achievement, as this data shows, then one must ask the question, why are we going to continue doing it? Or Rather than us maybe even just stopping at this point, it looks as though when we go further into what we're going to do with our next budget, we're going to be doing even more than we have in the past. I think we need absolutely to take a look at that. And just the idea that we switch from student achievement to parental choice, uh, I think that uh, we need to get back to what we started out in the beginning doing, which, which is student achievement. And then on the uh, idea, you know, we've been saying this all along, and I guess because as a teacher, I know I taught for 34 years before I came to the legislature. Part of it, I did both. I would come down here and go back. So I've been, and I've been on the education committee on my 33 years here in the, in the Indiana General Assembly. So I've watched this whole education reform uh, evolve. And what we've said from the beginning, those of us who are teachers have said, it's not competition that's going to get us what we need to get out of students. It is cooperation, collaborations, and you don't need to pay teachers extra to do that. We are in the teaching profession because we care about students and we want to see them achieve. So I, you know, I, I hope that we will take this data-driven uh, evidence uh, that is, uh, is, is uh, bipartisan and, and make certain that we incorporate that into what we decide to do as a legislature. And I'd just like to thank you so much for, for coming. And uh, as a fellow IU graduate, I'm not surprised that we have the same opinion. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? Okay, thank you.